been invited to be a part of this uh, celebration. I have had uh, a scientific interaction with Mauricio <clears throat> because I realized by accident that his focal decomposition is in fact the starting point for any semi-classical approximation that you may attempt in physics. Semi-classical approximations are maybe the next best thing to a full quantization of a theory. And so, at first when I was invited to come to, the, to this meeting, I thought I will talk about focal decomposition and semi-classical physics and so on. But then I said, what the heck? I mean, there are so many good mathematicians there. Let me talk about physics. And about one aspect of physics, which fascinates Mauricio, I'm sure, because he's told me a number of times, which is this uh, magic jump from mathematics, in this beautiful language, to the real world. Not that mathematics is not part of the real world, but it is probably the only language with a chance of describing the uh, physical world. And what I'm bringing here is a very simple example in terms of mathematics, but with uh, rather astonishing consequences. So I'll let you be the judge of that. I, uh, here I am uh, acknowledging the support of my university. In fact, nowadays I am connected with the Vali Technological Institute. It's an institute that's being created by Vali, our biggest mining company. It's the second company in the world. But my origin uh, is the F Institute of Physics of the Federal University of Rio. And uh, don't be afraid of the title. I will try to explain each one of these words. And I here have to thank my university, our National Research Council. Both these institutions paid my salary last year, which was when part of this work was done. And FAPESP, the State Foundation of the State of Sao Paulo, which made a generous contribution to uh, our comings and goings, which allowed us to uh, accomplish the uh, research. My collaborators in this, uh, Luis Eduardo Oliveira, an old time friend, we met when we were 12 years old. And this friendship is still uh, you know, resisting. Uh, we're going to celebrate our golden jubilee in a couple of years. So I, I, I've known him longer than I, I have known my wife. Solange Cavalcante, he's from the University of Campinas and uh, is the guy responsible for the FAPESP support. Solange Cavalcante is from the University of, uh, Federal University of Alagoas in Maceió, beautiful place. Bruno Alfonso, he's from Colombia, but presently in, in Sao Paulo. Ernesto Reyes Gomez, who is a Cuban physicist, but working in Colombia with Ernesto Raigosa. And Dimitri uh, Mogilev Tsev, who was a collaborator uh, part of uh, last year and the year before that. Okay, so what are metamaterials? Metamaterials are also called negative index structures or left-handed materials. <coughs> left-handed because, uh, you know, normally you learn in your uh, electromagnetism courses that you have the electric vector, right, electric field, the magnetic field, and then you use the right-hand rule to find out where the pointing vector is, right? Here, since n, the fraction in this is negative, the pointing vector points the other way. So it's opposite to the wave vector. Okay? Now, in 1968, Victor Veselago just suggested a mathematical curiosity. What if the dielectric constant, or dielectric permeability, and the magnetic permittivity were negative? Then the refraction index, which is given by this formula, would be negative. And he started playing with the consequences of that. But at the time, this was a mere curiosity. There's no way that one could find this in nature. In fact, uh, if you look at this diagram, you will see that only materials with positive magnetic permittivity are found in nature. This is the common example that you have in dielectrics. You may have... Uh, negative dielectric constant in plasmas and, and metals at optical frequencies. However, negative mu is something that you will not find 
in naturally occurring materials. Turns out that, uh, you know, creativity is an unbounded quantity or characteristic, I think, of human nature. And uh, about 2004, people started playing with uh, sort of mini circuits, in fact, nano circuits, that would uh, simply uh, mimic the fact that you might be thinking of this whole structure as long as the wavelength of light is big compared to the spacing of these various structures as a homogeneous medium that would have both epsilon and mu negative. And what at the time was just, a, you know, as the title says, a positive outlook for negative refraction, in the years to come, did become a reality, and people are now making nano devices which do have this property. So you have epsilon, which is a negative quantity, mu, which is a negative quantity, and therefore a negative index of refraction. Now, so I've told you about metamaterials. Totally, you know, out of the blue, blue uh, conjecture, which years later became reality because people playing with uh, nanophysics realized that they could actually build circuits that would satisfy this property. Now, the next element in the title is photonics. What's photonics? Photonics is the science and technology of generating and controlling the flow of photons, light. We want to play with light, to guide light, to do tricks with light, okay? It is a promising uh, area because it's probably going to underpin, it is already underpinning certain technological developments, but we're talking here of revolutions in signal processing, communications, computing, astrophysics, biology, medicine, and so forth. Today, FAPESP, this state foundation, has a bulletin, and they have an interview with a Brazilian physicist who works in the United States, talking about the possibilities for photonics for quantum computing, for, uh, you know, next generation computers. The photonic crystal is, in fact, the working currency of photonics. It's a regular structure that offers propagating photons a periodic variation in refraction index. So what you have is some kind of periodic arrangement where you change the, the index of refraction in a regular manner. Okay? So it is a, so a crystal made up of materials that have different indices of refraction. Now, the periodicity here can range in size from centimeters down to tens of nanometers. And it's in the nanometer scale that we have great hopes for this kind of uh, system. Of course, uh, none of this is, uh, is unknown to nature. In fact, uh, it's been playing with systems that have varying indices of refraction for millions of years. And here's a beautiful example. The wings of a butterfly are, of course, an example where you have this phenomenon of, you know, it's essentially a photonic crystal. Sorry? The butterfly exhibit picture is associated to the negatives. No, no. In the case of the butterfly, I, 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 I went ahead of myself. Uh, uh, the butterfly is an example of a photonic crystal. The wings of a butterfly are, correspond to a, a periodic arrangement of indices of refraction. But it's not a metamaterial. You cannot find metamaterials in nature. You cannot find them in nature. That's why. I, I, I stress the point that this was a mathematical curiosity in 1968, turned reality because people then could make uh, nano devices, micro devices, which sort of uh, concocted this negative uh, uh, magnetic permittivity, which is essential to have a mathematical. So you can't find them in nature, as I sh I've shown in, in, in the second slide. Now, as for photonic crystals, you do find them in nature. And one example is, of course, an almost poetic example, the wings of a butterfly. Of course, all of this has been uh, made possible because you know, here you see a, a, a quote from, from James Clerk Maxwell, which he did not like particularly. 
at the end of the 19th century, he said, in a few years, all the great physical constants would have been approximately estimated, and the only occupation which will then be left to the men of science would be to carry these measurements to another place of decimals, which would turn metrology into our only scientific field, right? However, uh, the quote is from 1871, and of course, uh, three decades later, Max Planck in December of 1900 announced his formula for the black body spectrum, the first shot at the quantum revolution. And in fact, all that came after that led to this fantastic statement here, which is already uh, outdated, but in 2001, which is the date of this issue of Scientific American, it was estimated that 30% of the United States growth national product was based on inventions made possible by quantum mechanics, from semiconductors in computer chips to lasers in, in CDs, magnetic resonance imaging in hospitals, and much more. And if you add to that the theory of relativity, this percentage is going to be much bigger because nuclear physics and all these things, electron positron tomography. So when economists start saying that you have to cut the budget, right, and that uh, science and technology represent spending, we should say it's not spending, it's investment. And since the government says that investments are okay, we should be fine, right? The world is a bit more complicated than that. Anyway, so here we're going to uh, make a comparison between electronics and photonics in, in the transparencies that will follow. But before that, there's yet another term in the title that some of you may never have, <coughs> may, have, <coughs> may, have may not have heard of before, which is plasmonics. What's plasmonics? Plasmonics is the study of plasmons. Plasmons are just quanta of plasma oscillations. So you have a plasma, so a charged gas of particles. The, the gas will oscillate, and the, the quantified oscillations are called plasmons. So it's a quasi-particle resulting from the quantization of plasma oscillations, just as photons and phonons are quantizations of light and mechanical vibrations, respectively. So they are the collective excitations of the free electron gas, for example. And whenever you couple a photon to a plasmon, you have a structure which is called a plasma polariton or a plasmon polariton. And I'm explaining this because this will come up in what's to come. Again, plasmons are things that are becoming more and more important from a technological point of view. Uh, they appear in... in, in, in LEDs and all sorts of devices. Uh, here is an example, somewhat futuristic, but uh, not very far from reality. You may uh, use little nanoparticles of silica with a gold uh, coating, uh, which will then be uh, put into the bloodstream of a patient with cancer, with the tumor, and they will then be located around the area of the tumor, and when excited with uh, near-infrared laser uh, light, this will act on the tumor and destroy the, uh, the, the, the cancer cells. So these, this kind of treatment where you use nanoparticles and in connection with beams is already something that's being used to treat diseases. There's yet another great application which now has to uh, resort to the metamaterials. So I'm coming back now to something which is next to a science fiction, but it has been shown experimentally, which is the possibility that <coughs> if you have metamaterials, uh, all you have to do is to somehow deflect the waves that would normally be scattered off a certain object, in such a way that when they regroup, it's as if they had never been altered. And so you cannot see the object. Okay? <clears throat> and here is an example. Uh, this is a, a structure made of uh, nested fiberglass cylinders with uh, split copper rings, which are distributed 
and uh, the, this particular structure will deflect microwaves around the innermost cylinder and return the waves to their original path on the other side, so they hide whatever is inside. Another example, this is really futuristic, is you, know, you could involve this uh, space uh, ship here with a shell of metamaterial, okay? Then, because of the funny properties of the metamaterials, you would have light coming from a galaxy, a space telescope here. You would simply hide the uh, spaceship. You couldn't see it. You would have a truly invisible cloak. And that would probably make Harry Potter lose his job because, you know, nothing else to, you know. Anyway, so enough for the... Uh, the marketing of, of the various subjects that I'm trying to talk about. The uh, conclusion is that uh, nanoplasmonics in, in the physics of it is, is still young but uh, very rich in phenomena that have inspired practical uses in many, many uh, disciplines, physics, biomedicine, environmental monitoring, and even national security, as you can imagine, right? Invisible spies and things like that. Obviously, what I'm saying here is... Uh, I'm not telling you the whole story. Of course, these uh, uh, checks, experimental checks of invisibility, have been uh, accomplished for certain uh, uh, regions of the spectrum, microwaves, for example. But recently, even without metamaterials, people have obtained similar results, again, for restricted uh, regions of the spectrum. So uh, we're still uh, learning, but uh, it's promising. As for photonic uh, crystals, uh, the title of this uh, article that appeared in Nature is quite suggestive, putting a new twist on light. In fact, they uh, are now, these photonic crystals are materials that are patterned with the periodicity in, in dielectric constant, which can create a range of forbidden frequencies like a photonic band gap. Photons with energy lying in the band gap cannot propagate through the medium, and this provides the opportunity to shape and mold the flow of light for photonic information technology. So the punchline here is that what I'm going to show you from now on is a combination of photonic crystals, okay, which have this essential property, they behave as metals in a sense. So they are the equivalent for photons of what happens with electrons in a crystal. Okay? And because you know from quantum mechanics that electrons in a crystal, right, have a distribution of energies that have energy gaps, I will show you that the equations, the mathematical equations that describe photonic crystals are exactly the same as the equations that are derived from Schrodinger's equation describing electrons in quantum mechanics. And therefore, the same, same kind of effect that you have for electrons, so-called electron band gaps in the, dist in the uh, energy distribution versus uh, uh, momentum, will appear here too, with a photonic crystal. Difference being that photons are very quick. And therefore, as you move from electrons, so from electronics to photonics, your computers will be much, much faster and we are going to probably enter a new world in terms of technological applications. And these gaps are essential. So what we've done with this group of people from Campinas and Colombia and so on, was to study how these gaps emerge. And when you add metamaterials to this uh, recipe, something interesting will happen. And that's what I'm going to try to show you. Uh, again, just a Another, give you an idea how, how these things have become, uh, you know, sort of popular. There's a book by the Princeton University Press just about uh, photonic crystals. And uh, this is an example of what you can have. You can have them microfabricated being periodic in one dimension uh, or two dimensions or even three dimensions. And in the two-dimensional case, for example, this is a schematic example of a photonic crystal of air columns in a dielectric substrate. So what you have here, the, 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 the white things are just, uh, you know, empty cylinders. They have air. Air has dielectric constant epsilon equal, equals one. 
and the material in this other color here, which I do not dare uh, specify since I'm colorblind, but it looks like uh, greenish or whatever, or orange, or, or some. Anyway, they're all wavelengths, so one's close to the other. This is a different dielectric constant. So this is an arrangement which is a true photonic crystal. And as a result, when you look at the frequency of the radiation versus uh, its uh, wavelength, or sorry, wave number or uh, wave vector, k, what you find that you have all these curves, omega versus k, and you immediately notice that there is a photonic band gap here. The curves of different colors are either for uh, transverse electric modes or transverse magnetic modes, which seem simply means that you have the electric field aligned with the normal to the surface or the magnetic field aligned with the normal to the surface, or actually perpendicular to. And the important thing is that you do create a photonic band gap, just as you have gaps in electronic systems, in crystals. <coughs> the mathematics behind all of this Mauricio doesn't remember, but I have a, an electromagnetist book that you, right, Stratton. I have to return it. But if you go to that particular book, and if we work out Maxwell's equations, you find an equation here, which is the master equation for all of this, which is simply a direct consequence of applying Maxwell. H is the magnetic field. E is the electric field. Uh, and the novelty when you deal with a photonic crystal is that the propagation of light in that particular medium, right, is described by Maxwell's equations. But on top of that, you have to add the fact that you have a periodic structure. And therefore, you expect that just like in quantum mechanics in a crystal, right, when you describe the wave functions of electrons, you have an index which has to do with the translation operator, which is this index n, because of the periodicity. Here also, your h's, for example, the magnetic field, will depend on k, which is the wave vector, but also on n. And then you are led to having wave vectors and bands in the Brillouin zone. Maurice, I had to talk about the Brillouin zone. Vargas yesterday was telling me, yes, I suggested this to Maurice. I said, sure. All knowledge comes from Belo Horizonte. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, oops, sorry. So what, what you have here is that the, the field will propagate through the crystal in a coherent manner as a block wave. And the understanding of block waves for electrons explain the great mysteries of 19th century physics. Why do electrons behave like free particles in many examples of conducting crystals? Here, you have built something which has a periodic structure of dielectric constants in such a way, as I will show in the next uh, transparencies, that the equation that describes this, which is a direct consequence of Maxwell's equation, purely classical, nothing quantum, right, is then of the same kind as the equations that you derive by using Schrodinger's equations, which are completely quantum, to describe the motion of electrons in a periodic structure. So what happens for electrons in a crystal, in an ordinary crystal, will happen for photons in a photonic crystal. And there you see, uh, this is a sort of a, uh, a resume, uh, resume version of what I have just said. In quantum mechanics, you have a wave function. In electrodynamics, you have some field, the, electro, the magnetic field, for example. You can do the same for the electric field. Then you have an eigenvalue problem where you have here the Schrodinger operator. This H has nothing to do with that H. Sorry. This H is the Schrodinger operator acting on a, an electron wave function. Okay. Whereas here, you have another operator which comes from the express, the so-called master equation that I have written before, which operates on the magnetic field. And again, you do have, you know, an eigenvalue equation, where here you have the energy of the electrons, whereas here you have 
essentially the energy of the photons, right? because h, h omega, h bar omega, is the energy of the photons associated. And because you have discrete translational symmetry in both cases, in quantum mechanics, it's the potential that varies in a discrete manner. In electrodynamics, it's the dielectric constant and the, the magnetic permittivity. And because you have this translational symmetry, that means that the translation operator commutes with the Hamiltonian or commutes with this uh, uh, operator for the uh, electrodynamics case. And therefore, due to Bloch's theorem, you can write the wave function in this form as a, a plane wave, but modulated by something which is depending on a translation index n. And likewise, this happens for the magnetic field. And therefore, you have a complete dictionary that will take you from electronics to photonics. In fact, we have studied a very simple case of photonic crystal which is one-dimensional. So what you have here is a succession of different media. And this length here is A, this length here is B, and the so-called unit cell of this uh, structure, the one that keeps repeating itself, has size D. Okay. Therefore, you have uh, an incident uh, electromagnetic wave here, which will go through this succession of of indices of, of refraction that change in a periodic manner. Uh, normally, uh, for example, you can study N1, which is the index of refraction uh, for uh, medium 1, as being air, so essentially 1. And uh, N2 may be dependent, dependent on the frequency. And the interesting case, which will lead to the metamaterial case, is when this guy is negative, okay? And so this is the prototype of what we have used as our basic system of study. Again, just Maxwell's equations. You, yeah, this is it's, it's it's really simple. This is not does not even qualify for elect, graduate electromagnetism. You can actually teach teach this in undergraduate electromagnetism derive the equations that will describe the propagation. And so you have something that comes from the wave equation. Then you plug in a linearly polarized wave, and you get this sort of uh, uh, eigenvalue equation with n standing for the product of the square root of epsilon and square root of mu, and z is the combination that denotes the ratio of these two quantities. This is something that you can solve very simply using what we call a transfer matrix technique, which is essentially equivalent to putting E and its derivative as a part of a, a doublet and uh, showing how the equations uh, lead to the dynamical evolution from one side to another side of the unit cell. So this matrix M acting on this will take the electri electric field at uh, one end of your unit cell to the other end of the unit cell, and you just keep multiplying it, you eventually find out what comes <coughs> at the other end of your uh, apparatus. Of course, there's a block condition, and as a result of all of that, we can derive a dispersion relation, which is the relationship between the omega of the radiation and the k of the radiation. And it's by inspecting this dispersion relation that we are able to find out whether or not there are gaps in the spectrum. And these energy gaps, as I have mentioned, are very important for the construction of nano devices for all sorts of applications. So learning about them is the point of this exercise. In fact, uh, this is an example of what comes out for media, which are just ordinary media, right? What you get is frequency versus uh, wave vector, Q or K or whatever, okay? And then you have all these uh, curves here, and you see that there is a gap, a region here. If you, you know, take a line that from this point to that point, and the, another one from this point to that point, you see that within that region of energies, there is no propagation. So, in fact, that's sort of a, a filter. Only certain regions of the spectrum will be transmitted, will propagate. Others will not. 
And that's what leads to so many applications. Uh, again, this is uh, an exercise that was done by the group that I collaborate with uh, prior to my arrival to this, uh, to this uh, uh, team of collaborators. And they simply did an exercise computing using this transfer matrix technique. They computed the, the, the energy spectrum, uh, the dispersion relation for a given a photonic structure. The interesting thing was when they coupled their study to metamaterials. So you still kept the, the medium, which I labeled one, as something like air or some ordinary medium. But then imagine that you take for medium two something which is frequency dependent and furthermore that can have negative values. Therefore, being characterized as a true metamaterial. And a number of people looked at this. We did likewise. In fact, uh, the kind of, of, uh, of dependence on, on, the, on omega of the radiation that we had for the dielectric constant is expressed here. This is called a Drude type response. And similarly for the magnetic uh, permittivity, which is something that can only be accomplished if you fiddle with nano devices. So in fact, if you use mini circuits and, and form a sort of a split ring resonator, which is what then has this behavior if you consider it as a homogeneous medium. Uh, and the, the big surprise was that when you put in metamaterials, a new gap appears. The first gap that you have in your spectrum is a totally unexpected thing. It's called the average n equals zero gap because people at first thought that uh, the gap developed around a certain frequency which corresponded to the average of the indices of refraction being zero. So you have a certain index n1 in spacing A, an index n2 in spacing B, right? Take the average. When this is zero, you find the frequency around which a gap opens, okay? So this was called the n equals zero gap. Now, why is this gap interesting? It's interesting, and there you see the, uh, the actual picture. That's the gap I'm talking about. It's very interesting because it's what's called a non-Bragg gap. It's funny when you define something by saying that it's, it's, it's not something else, okay? But this is, the reason here is because we don't know what it is exactly. Okay? Normally, when these gaps uh, have an interpretation in terms of Bragg reflections, the electromagnetic wave or, for example, the electron wave function, right, has a certain commensurate relation with the lattice spacing in such a way that you have reflections from, say, the uh, different ions in a, in a crystal or from the... Uh, from the um, places where you, have, where you have changes in media in the photonic crystals. And you ha this leads to sort of a destructive interference be between the incoming light and the light that is reflected. And this is the physical explanation for why you develop gaps in ordinary uh, crystals, or photonic crystals for that matter. However, in this case, that explanation does not uh, hold because the gaps here they're very robust with respect to the layer size. The, the size of the unit cell, which is D, right? Gaps here will be totally independent of D, which is completely different from what happens with Bragg gaps. And therefore, this is a gap of a different nature, which makes it even more interesting. And in fact, our collaborators here, uh, using this kind of the dispersion relation for the, uh, sorry, for the uh, Drude type of relations for the uh, dielectric and, and magnetic constants, uh, they obtained this uh, gap, and furthermore, they realized, in fact, this was realized later on, that the boundaries of the gap corresponded to where either mu had its average being zero or epsilon had its average being zero. And in fact, in the middle, the sort of middle frequency is the one that gives you the n equals zero gap. Okay, but the true condition is that <coughs> this is what defines the gap. 
Okay, so this was promising. We've, we've, we found a gap. We were not the only ones to find this gap. Other, other uh, groups had found this gap. They realized that it wasn't a, a brag gap. We contributed to the fact that everybody was talking about an n equals zero gap. It's not an n equals zero gap. This is re rather inappropriate. You should call it a, a gap where the upper boundary is uh, the average value of mu, mu equals zero and the, the lower epsilon equals zero, depending on whether you have a TE or TM mode. It could be the other way around. So we managed to characterize this precisely. But then we moved on and added to the study the possibility of having light incident on that stack at an angle. So all that I was describing before was for normal incidence. If you now put it at an angle, so if you have a same kind of arrangement, A and B, A being a normal medium, B being a medium that may have funny uh, electric and magnetic constants, right? And now uh, a wave that's inciting, inciting it's incident on, the, on, the, on the, the stack at an angle, we discovered, again with a very interesting thing, which justifies the fact that I had to add plasmonics to the title. That's why I had a title this big, apart from a certain degree of megalomania, which is I think, inherent in physicists. Right? <laughs> and the idea was that uh, if you have normal incidence, right, then, which is reflected here by saying that theta is equal to zero, theta is the angle, right, with the normal. Then you look at the uh, spectrum and you find frequency versus wave vector. You have here a line. Then you have a little gap, which is very small here in the picture, but it's there. And another... Uh, curve here. This curve denotes pure photonic modes, just light propagating. Okay? Now, there's also something which is a pure plasmon mode that you could have in the system, a completely pure plasmon mode, which would correspond to the fact that electromagnetic waves will induce oscillations of the electrons that are in the, in the system. And these oscillations will be quantized, and of course you may have plasma modes, which are here described by this particular frequency. The n equals zero gap, the non-Bragg gap, is right there. And here you see a phenomenon for normal incidence where you have photonic behavior, plasmonic behavior completely decoupled. What we've seen is that as you make uh, light incident at an angle, you promote the coupling between the photons and the plasmons, constructing something which is called a plasmon polariton. So, a name. To denote the fact that what you have here propagating in this structure is the coupling of photons and plasmons in a coherent way, and therefore you see there is a change in the spectrum, and this line here and this line here they're neither photons nor plasmons. They are a coupled system of plasmon and photon. And this is the thing that propagates. Again, opening up new possibilities because this thing you can control in different manners. There you see another view. This happens whether you're dealing with transverse electric or transverse magnetic modes. These are then the coupled modes and the dashed lines showing you the pure modes. And of course, we then checked about uh, you know, our results by looking at the transmission through the stack to, f to find out that there was, in fact, a gap. I will be run through this very quickly. Uh, we investigated the effect of absorption effects because this was not included in our first analysis. And in any real medium, you do have absorption, absorption effects. We found out that this was re reasonably robust. Of course, there, there were... The peaks that you saw for uh, absorption and transmission are changed, obviously, but the effect is still there. We uh, turned a little mathematical and we started playing with uh, Fibonacci uh, super lattices. So you can construct these super lattices in any way you, you like, right? And you can tell the experimentalists, now I want 
this relationship between A and B and so on, or this relationship between the different structures. And so we played a little bit with this to find out whether or not this uh, behavior was robust, whether or not you always had these gaps, right? And the truth of the matter is that regardless of what you do, of the geometry that you put in for constructing your crystal, as long as you have metamaterials involved, right, you do come up with this special gap. You do come up with the plasmon polariton uh, uh, phenomenon when you have oblique incidence. And so it gives us confidence that we will manage to uh, do this in, in various uh, contexts and environments. Uh, again, just nice pictures of spectra and so on. You don't want to know about this. Uh, the absorption effects were, were also investigated with regard to the plasma polaritons. Uh, again, just nice pictures. And this is one that I particularly like. Uh, we managed at some point to uh, explain what was happening by, you know, when physicists don't know a lot about something, they try to relate it to something else by means of some kind of an effective theory or an effective model. And that's exactly what we've done. We imagine. Ah, what if I thought of this unit cell that has two different media as one homogeneous medium? What sort of uh, characteristics does this have? And so by playing with the equations, we were able to come up with a medium, the effective medium, that mimics exactly the behavior of the, the, the structure that has two different media, right? Is such that it is absorbing at exactly the frequencies where you see the gaps. This is still short of an explanation because we do not know the physical mechanism that leads to that. But we know that it's consistent with having a, 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 a material there so which effectively has this property of absorbing light in those regions. And what you see there, I'm very proud of this because I did this calculation in airplanes. Of course, business class, after all. Uh, flying high. Flying high, yes. Uh, last year, as I was at the National Research Council, I had to fly a lot. Some, some long trips, going to India, for example, or Japan. And then, you know, when you're short of, uh, I don't know, scotch, you just start uh, doing calculations, right? <laughs> and in fact, this calculation, it is very surprising, because I did an analytic calculation, which seems to reproduce the actual results, which were computed numerically to high precision, beyond what we expected. So this is an embarrassment. It's better than we, what it should be. We expected this to be... That's dangerous, yes. It, it, should, it should be very good around the middle uh, region here. But for some reason, because it, it, it's the result of an approximation where you approximate two, you approximate two sides of the equation, there seems to be some magic cancellation between the things that you're leaving out, which allows the approximation to be good even near the borders of the Brillouin zone. But this just goes to show that, in fact, this interpretation in terms of an effective medium seems to be uh, holding. Again, uh, this is just a, a, a description of... Uh, here we, we, we look at, uh, in detail uh, at the gaps for different... Uh, situations and you see that here the angle is varying so that we actually looked at the plasma polarity gaps and our explanation of this effective medium seems to hold for normal incidence for oblique incidence and so on so it seems to be okay all right so i'm coming to the end uh i thought that i was uh much beyond my time but apparently things are okay under control uh, Mr. Chairman has not given me that uh, terrible look, right? So, what are our conclusions at this point? First of all, we have somehow advanced in our understanding of this funny n equals zero ga gap, which appears. At least we know that everything, you know, takes place as if I had a medium which absorbs in that particular region of the spectrum, how this medium, how you can come up to this medium from the actual physical uh, 
construction is, is yet something to be understood. The photonic dispersion indicates that for oblique incidence, the longitudinal component uh, region around these two conditions that characterize the gap leads to the propagation of plasma polaritons. And by choosing the electronic or, magne or magnetic plasma frequency inside the zeroth order gap, it's shown that the coupling of light with plasmons weakens considerably, which is an expected result. Right? If you choose the plasma frequency in the gap, right, since photons are not propagating, you do not expect a coupling with plasmons. And therefore, this is an effect that you truly observe. Furthermore, uh, our plasma polaritons seem to be robust in the presence of moderate levels of uh, absorption. Of course, if the absorption, if the absorption is, is, is beyond, uh, you know, it's very, very big, then you don't have anything propagating. It's, everything is absorbed. But for moderate levels, we do find that these results are robust. And finally, we have managed to uh, come up with some analytical results for plasma polaritons and in the n equals zero non bragg gap and omni-reflectance by doing simply simple expansion of the dispersion relation, which is exact, but it's uh, difficult to, to deal with. You can only deal with it numerically. Before I come to the end, I brought you some pictures, since we're celebrating Mauricio's birthday, right? And because last year I had the privilege of being the president of our National Research Council for one year, and, I, and my, when I said my farewell address, I said I was brief but intense. <laughs> I could not resist bringing some pictures of one of my predecessors. In fact, he's the dean of the former presidents of CNPq, of the National Research Council. And I think that Mauricio will be surprised with this picture here, where he is uh, next to uh, Mario Henrique Simonsen who was a very brilliant man, our former Minister of Planning, Minister of Finance, a man of very influential and very uh, mathematically minded, right? Am I, I, I guess he was a student at INPA at some point, right? No. Be a brilliant guy, yes. Yeah. And I, I know that he had a very uh, special liking for mathematics. That's what I've been told. So, I think this is Giuseppe Lucio Ferreira. This man was responsible for actually creating the other funding agency of the Ministry of Science and Technology. The Ministry of Science and Technology has the National Research Council, CNPq, as one of its funding agencies, which is directed towards researchers mostly, and FINAPI, which is directed to uh, institutions, whether they be universities or companies, was I think it's fair to say uh, a creation of Giuseppe Lucio Ferreira. I don't know who this is. Maybe the next photograph will elucidate that. That's probably José John de Melo Teles, uh, who was also. Okay. So that's uh, one uh, picture of Mauricio as president of CNPq. That's uh, I think a different picture. But there you find Lindolfo, Lindolfo de Carvalho Dias. I don't know what he was doing there, but uh, all is an influential man. Who was vice president? He was vice president. Lindolfo has had so many positions in Brazil that it's hard to say, right? Okay. Now, there's one other picture here. And this is the picture that hangs on the wall of former presidents of CNPq in Brasilia. And from what Mauricio tells me, it was taken by Lindolfo yes. in his house here yes. in Jardim Botan. Yes. So the trees that you see there, you know, I, I always found that, that picture, it's the only picture that has trees and uh, sort of a different background. So, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, well, it, that, it's, it's sort of symbolic, right? <laughs> 
it, it's a true pictorial description of what we had to go through. Right? <laughs> and finally, uh, when he became a distinguished researcher of the National Research Council, I don't know what year was that, but it was, this is somewhat recent, I, I, I believe. So these are four pictures that I asked the people at CNPQ. It's not to, very recent because I, 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 I was wearing a tie. You were wearing a tie. <laughs> That's true. You, you do have a point. Anyway, so it's been a pleasure. And I think that all I can say is happy birthday, Mauricio. Many, many thanks for all you have taught us. And thank you all for the attention.